Well, shalom, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. I thought we would look at the subject of fellowship today because it has come up in recent days. And, and I'm kind of listening to the way it's kind of used sometimes um, when people use it in a teaching. And it's sort of it's almost like a, a motivational word that's kind of kind of used or it's a it's a sort of a catch all term. It's it's a term that's used to to invoke this sort of uh, sort of institutional type feel of the body of people who profess to follow the teachings of the Messiah. And so I thought I have to address this because there's something quite odd about this. And as I investigated the subject, I found some interesting things that I thought I might share in this video. Now, first of all, let us look at the English word fellowship. It is a quite an archaic word. It's a word that's probably used mostly in a religious context, and it can be used interchangeably with the word communion, which is very much a word that's used in religious, exclusively to sort of religious environments or some sort of spiritual pursuit. And these are words which I call ecclesiastical language. They, they, there are many ecclesiastical words in religion. Uh, another example would be the word holy, which comes from the Hebrew word uh, kodesh, which simply means to be set apart. It's a bit of a disappointment. The word holy sounds so much more amazing. Uh, but it so kind of has the potential to sort of paint a false picture. Uh, but not only that, when you start using words exclusively in a religious setting and then not using them in a normal sort of daily living setting, it promotes a type of compartmentalization to begin to emerge in your life. And the concept of compartmentalization is very dangerous. And it isn't something, it's something that's very foreign to Judaism and it's foreign to Torah because everything is a card, everything is one. Uh, you don't simply go on a particular day to do something religious and then at the finish of that, go home and then change garments, as it were, and put on your sort of secular type of outlook and go about your, your secular life uh, in a different type of way. This should be a faith that follows you home from your ritual aspects of your observance, follows you into the house, into the kitchen, into the living room, uh, into the laundry, uh, even into the bedroom and even into the toilet, out in the field, along the way, in the car. It is it is it follows you home. The 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 Torah and uh, living a, a, a Torah obedient lifestyle in whatever capacity you find yourself whether you're a man or you're a woman, uh, whether you're disabled, uh, whether you are a Noahide, whether you are looking to convert, or whether you've been uh, an ultra-Orthodox from Jew for your entire life. It's, uh, it's, it's something that permeates everything. It even permeates your thoughts. You can't switch it off. You, you know, It's not like, okay, we'll just go in a bubble and, and we're okay, we can say whatever we want here. No, this is, this is who you are. This is how you operate. Whether you are sitting in a religious environment, uh, a synagogue or, or uh, some sort of, uh, maybe it's a community hall and maybe you're, you're observing a high holy day or something. You aren't sort of just doing your thing there and then now you're going home and then you can drop all that and focus on something else. That's not how it works. But by adopting this ecclesiastical language as we do, and we do do it and it's hard not to do it because... Otherwise, you're, you're going to be like explaining yourself every time you use a, say a sentence. Uh, so for the most part, we are stuck with, with using these terms. And I'm not saying in this video that you shouldn't use the term fellowship. I just want to look at the term fellowship and look and see what it is it really means and whether it's something that we should really be as focused on as some uh, teachers and some some people who are trying to find their feet in the Torah are really kind of making it out to be. Because I have quite a few people that comment and and uh, and, and uh, really sort of seem like they're, they're screaming for, for, for to have fellowship with other people, be around other like-minded believers, which is not a bad thing. It's nothing wrong with that. But it seems like that is the, the thing that they're really starved of and it's the thing that they really want. And uh, in this current climate where we are, where mankind is sitting spiritually, we're in the sort of a, a low generation, the, the generation is in quite a low state, 
a lot of times when we do front up to a gathering of, of people with a similar, as what we think, a similar mindset, after, if not straight away, after a period of time, we find it brings with it a whole mess of issues and there's arguments, there's debates, there's clicky groups, and there's Lash and Hara, there's Motsi Shemra, there's, and there's backbiting and there's all these things and there's people kind of intimidated by other people uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And you, you kind of, you, your problems start once you get involved in a group. Am I saying that you shouldn't get involved in a group? Not at all. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, let's have a look at the subject. Let's iron it out because I found a few things as I looked into it in the last couple of days that I thought I might share that you might find interesting. Now, the, the word that we read translated as fellowship only appears in the Tanakh two times. It only appears in the Tanakh two times. It appears once in Leviticus 6.2 and once in Psalm 94.20. And when you look at the, the word itself, uh, tes, tesumet, tesumet is the Hebrew word. It's a word that m means more along the lines of uh, a pledge or making a deposit. Uh, whereas the, the English definition of the word fellowship means more of like a, a, some sort of social gathering. Uh, I think the wishful definition that many people have uh, represents an effort uh, uh, to constitute a group worthy to be gathered and receive the divine presence. That's what I think a lot of people want it to mean and, uh, and, and is maybe the intention behind the meaning of it. Um, but when we, we look at the Tanakh, we, look at the, we pull back and we look at the scriptures, we see something kind of very interesting beginning to... A, a metamorphosize appear. Now, what we have to understand is the the original the original Torah, the the sort of second temple era Judaism, has undergone a battering over the centuries, and it's weathered many many storms, and it's often hard to see what the original followers of Yeshua were actually about and where they were kind of sort of operating and, and where they are holding uh, when uh, juxtaposed against when you see the majority of the Christian world today, or at least the, the majority of the world that professes to kind of be towing the same line as those original Talmudim, those original students of Yeshua. And it's almost like a universe apart when you, st when you turn stop and just look at it for a few moments and you're shocked and you're like, okay, this is way off. This is completely different. Now, the problem is that a lot of people who are starving for fellowship are people that are uh, actually, they're lonely. They're, they're crying out for companionship, for some type of interaction with people. They are extremely lonely. Uh, the, and, and you're even made more lonely by the sense that you're rejected by the church now. You're rejected by the Orthodox Jewish world and even the Reformed Jewish world are kind of a bit sus on you. Uh, and really, you're kind of standing in no man's land. And so this compounds this sense of isolation. And if a person's already kind of struggled with feelings of being lonely prior to, to this eventuating, this is just like feeling lonely on steroids. Okay, and so Hasatan tries to take advantage of this as best he can to push you further and further away and uh, be, make you become more and more despondent, which is, we don't want that to happen. Now, a lot of people who are craving this concept of fellowship are actually just craving some sort of social interaction with like-minded people, as I've said. And that's not an issue. That's not a problem. That's, that's, you can understand where that's coming from, and it's not coming from a bad place. But what some of these people fail to understand is precisely the place that they are in in the moment, which is a place of isolation, a place of solitude, a, pr a place where they really don't have any uh, much, if any, interaction at all with like-minded believers, which, to be perfectly honest, is hard to understand and hard to accept because most of us have access to technology, which means we have access to all 
the teachings and all the information, uh, if we can get on a Zoom group and we can have real-time interaction with people, no matter where you're located. So no time in history has it been easier for you to actually connect with other people and remain physically isolated and yet have constant mentorship and interaction and teaching with good teachers and good mentors and so on and so forth. So you only have to go back not much more than 20 years. And if you wanted to do that, you had to have a pen pal and you had to send them a letter and then you had to wait a couple of weeks, sometimes months before you got a reply. So, it, you know, we've really rounded a corner in the last 20 or 30 years uh, with technology that brought with it advantages and disadvantages because it's easy to acquire great understanding, great knowledge, but it's also easy to acquire distraction and, dis and, and acquire things that are going to cause you damage and destruction. So we have to be very, very careful. It's a lot easier to, to really excel spiritually in this, these last days because of the uh, ability to acquire information uh, through the Internet. But it's also a lot easier to fall. And the Yatsahara is working at triple time, quadruple time to try and trip you up as constantly and keep you distracted and keep you regaled and amused by the world of imagination. And there's so many different types of distractions out there with movies, video games, uh, the political landscape, uh, all of the, the personalities that are doing different things. Uh, you could literally be distracted for like 20 or 30 lifetimes, let alone one, if you allow yourself to, to go off and just go down that rabbit hole. So you have to really be strong to just go, okay, this is all Sheko, this is all nonsense. Music's another one. You know, uh, sport is a huge one. And these things aren't things that necessarily are evil or intrinsically evil. But what is the, the most damaging about them is that they'll actually take you away from times where you could have sat down and actually learned various subjects which could have helped you in various situations. One of the things that we will uh, be tempted to respond in our divine judgment is to respond with the uh, statement, I didn't know, I was ignorant. And what the, the, the din in Shemayim, what the, what the Beit Din in Shemayim have to do is, is if they hear a response like that, they are compelled to now go back and find out all the opportunities and the amount of times, the length and breadth of times that you've had over your lifetime where you could have sat down and learned and you have chosen to do something else. It might not necessarily have been something wicked or something evil, but it was just something other than actually sitting down and learning. And a lot of people today, they aren't learning what they should be learning in the Torah. Case in point, the current subject that I, I'm sort of fairly heavily focused on, which is the seven universal or seven uh, seven universal moral laws, which are known as the seven Noahide laws, or if you're familiar with some of my videos, the seven categories of universal moral laws, which should be front and center on all uh, so-called messianic believers' uh, agenda. And it is not at this time, but I'm doing my I'm doing the best I can to get this information to be outfield and get people to focus on the Torah that they should be focused on and less uh, concerned about Torah that really isn't in their sort of pay grade, so to speak. So there's this desire for fellowship. There's this desire for fellowship. Now, people love having uh, social interaction because social interaction is an opportunity to get immediate feedback. Uh, people can hear your, your opinions, really. Those of you that are familiar with my videos know that it's not good to have opinions. You don't need to have any opinions in this work, but people sometimes do. And even sometimes if I'm pressed and a person wants my opinion, meaning something that I'm not across or the length and breadth of, but they still want to hear what my feel, what my feeling on something is, you know, if they press me or twist my arm, I might tell them. But people want to hear what other people think of what they think about things, whether they're an opinion or whether it's, it's based on a length and breadth of learned study on a subject. And so people get this positive feedback or they get a bit of negative feedback or they get blank, face, blank faces. But what it does, it stimulates a person to get that feedback. And so that is the desire that sometimes or all the time resides within a person that seeks to have social interaction. And what inevitably happens, there are people within that social interaction 
that desire to be the center of attention. You have different types of believers in, in religious communities that I've seen over the years. You have the believer that turns up with a controversy, a new controversy every week. And uh, it'll be something to do with uh, the New World Order. It'll be something to do with the end of the world. It'll be something to do with Flat Earth. It'll be something to do with this. But their whole modus uh, operandi is to do something that causes a, like a, a flux within the community. And they get sort of a kick out of it. And, uh, and it makes them feel special, makes them feel important. And perhaps at the root of it, they have to come with something to knock somebody's socks off because they don't feel like they would be accepted any other way, which is not true. And I've often found myself telling people in the quiet and saying, listen, you don't have to turn up with a controversy every week. We like you just as you are. You don't have to turn up with something interesting to tell us for us to, us to like you. We like you already. Um, so what I'm saying is you might want to have a rethink about this desire to want to have fellowship, want to have constant interaction with people. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more, a little bit very shortly in the video of why it's so important to be on your own for at least a period of time before you enter into a situation where you are among other believers. It's very, very important. This is probably one of the most important videos that I've done in terms of uh, a, a sort of an illness. I've, I've kind of seen it as, a, as, as a, a little bit of an illness that I see in people. And uh, their antidote that they think is the antidote to that illness is kind of the wrong thing. And in fact, their illness at the moment is a wrong kind of perception of how they're viewing their current state on being on their own. They're, they're seeing it as something that they sh that shouldn't be happening to them. When in actuality, if they change their actual perspective and change their approach and the way they're thinking about their current circumstances, they will realize that this, the, the place they're in at the moment is one of the most uh, opportune places for them to be in. And it's not uh, a, a veiled to, to many people. And they're actually very blessed if they're in a position where they're kind of don't have much interaction with other people. Okay, so how is all this fellowship, uh, how has it become such an emphasis with trying to sort of rally the troops and, uh, you know, kind of look, this buzzword, like, we've got to have fellowship. If we don't have fellowship, we're not going to unite. We're not going to be a people. We're not going to have unity. Oh, and that's another whole subject, another whole other video, this whole concept of unity. People are so concerned with unity. If we don't have unity, we're going to be no more unity runs very much second to the emet, to the truth. If you do not have the truth, if a community is still is still kind of in flux about where it stands on just the basic concept of the truth, then you don't want unity at all because you will just have unified a group that is functioning under Sheka, functioning under falsehood. Okay, so you'd be very careful about this whole concept of focusing on unity Disunity is good if it's because the communities that are trying to unite have got some serious issues within them that they're refusing to address. One, you can you can have look at Nazi Germany that became unified and look at what a lot a lot of mess that it caused. Okay, so you know get off the kind of just this is just as a side. Like I said, I could do another whole video on the whole concept of unity. People say, oh, we lack unity. That's the problem within the movement. No, it's not. In fact, lack of unity is the solution or at least uh, the, the, the temporary solution until we get our act together. The problem in the Messianic community is that people are not focusing on what they should be focused on and they're not prepared to hear and walk out the truth. Okay, there you go. I've said it. You've heard it here. People are not focusing on what they should be focusing on and they're not prepared to walk out the truth. They're not prepared to they hear the truth. And if it's something that's personal, it's something that goes against what they really personally want to do, like people who are really set in getting a conversion as a messianic, no matter what you say to them. And so they'll get a conversion by hook or by crook. They'll do some sort of dodgy conversion online or meet a whole bunch of people who are make up a sort of an ad, ad hoc uh, bait din whose members that sit on the bait din's Judaism is questionable to say the least and they'll pay them a bunch of money and they'll send them a certificate a signed piece of paper 
that's not worth the, the ink that it was written with or the paper that it's written on. And it's only going to get him into trouble down the track. And it's, it's not recognized from the Orthodox Jewish world. And really, the Orthodox Jewish world is the only world that you should be concerned about in the long run. Okay, a little bit of a side note there. So, what is the thing that people uh, are not seeing in terms of being isolated and being on their own that is causing them distress and, and it should rather cause them great joy? Well, the reality is that many of the greats in the scriptures spent significant amount of time isolated. The, the, the greatest of the great, and we'll go through some of them, they spent a lot amount of time, like I'm talking nearly half a lifetime, on their own, with nobody else around, no internet, no like writing an envelope and a pen pal and all that, no one, very bare bones people, and we'll go through them. Joseph, who was sold into slavery in Egypt, and he uh, tried to sort of claw his way out of his situation by being a very devoted uh, servant and was betrayed by Potiphar's wife who made advances to him and lied about him trying to come onto her. And he was thrown into an Egyptian prison and there he stayed for a total of 13 years in prison and managed to, after all these things that happened to him, come out literally on top. And so these years were very important years for Yosef because they were years, they were formative years where he was building his character. He was building his strength, his fortitude, his imunah. Without these years, he would not have able to have come out like he did and become so successful in the latter years of his life. Being viceroy in Mitzrayim, which is the, the second most powerful people in the superpower nation of the world at that time in the, in the nation of Egypt. So do not uh, criticize or complain about your current status of being on your own or isolated. Look at it as a blessing. You've got to turn this all around and you've got to be thanking Hashem that you're in this situation. Those of you that don't have, you don't have your kids, your kids have been taken away from you. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've separated and divorced. Your kids have been taken in a state and you're living in a place on your own. Maybe you're house sharing, but there's hardly anybody around. Now you have all the opportunity and all the time in the world to study and to learn. Whereas before, oh, you had to do uh, like you had many responsibilities. Hashem has reduced all those responsibilities and he's possibly saying to you, I want you to have a period where you learn. I want you to learn. I want you to sit down and I want you to learn. Get yourself a routine going and I want you to study diligently. I want you to set a schedule and I want you to learn. That's why I'm not having your phone ringing 24-7 uh, throughout the day. That's why I'm not having friends just drop in at, at, uh, at, at odd times. And some of us who are, who are in positions where we're, we're on our own, we miss that. Because growing up, we were maybe not religious. We were secular. And we had friends popping in. And we had the phone ringing. And we were up, up to a very late on the phone having really juicy conversations and so, so on and so forth. And so that's what we gravitate towards. That's what we're used to. And this new type of life is very foreign to us. And it's hard for us to actually absorb and to understand and know which path we should go down and what we should be happy about and what we shouldn't be happy about. Okay, so the next, the next individual uh, that was isolated was Moshe Rabbeinu. For 40 years, he was on his own tending Jethro's sheep. I'm sure he had interactions every now and then. But for the large part, he was isolated from his people, all but forgotten. 40 years is a very long time. It's a good chunk, as I said, of a person's life. The nation of Israel, the entire nation of Israel, they were thrust into the wilderness and, and were forced to wander the wilderness for 40 years and be isolated from all the other nations of the world. The reason they were drawn into the wilderness, into the desert, is because there's, very, there's a lack of stimulants in the desert. And there's no one dwelling there. You're on your own. There's nothing else to distract you. And so for 40 years, the entire nation was removed from having any interaction with the nations, with the exceptions of situations like Midian, when they tried to seduce them with the daughters. And we know how, where that all went and how that went. 
But for the most part, Hashem was saying, listen, I'm going to keep them in the desert here. I'm going to keep them here for 40 years because they need to relearn how to think. They had need to relearn how to the, the whole outlook of how they perceived the world and life still very much had Egyptian influence on them. And all of us today, if we're, we're perfectly honest, we still have the influence of the world on us, even though we would pass a lie detector that we believe and we have faith in the God of the Jews and we want to follow the same God as the Jews. And this is evident by the fact that, you know, um, some of us, you know, might still watch a streaming service that if we posted anything on social media, people would sort of maybe question and say, oh, you shouldn't be watching that. And so we do it. We do it on the down low so nobody knows. So these are signs that we still very much have that old thinking process still kind of attached to us, uh, a de like a debook, an attachment uh, to us in some way that we have to shake off. And it, sometimes it can take a long period of time. 40 years, sometimes it can take an entire lifetime, but you want to be found always trying to shake it off and never just give in and just let it sort of grow on you like plankton. You have to do everything you can with what any, any whatever energy or resources you can do. And that's chiefly done through learning and applying that learning and you will begin to have success and have wins in that area, I'm telling you right now. Okay, so Yeshua himself, Yeshua himself, 40 days and for 40 nights, he was in the wilderness. So this was like a, a precursor uh, to his uh, the beginning of his ministry that he isolated himself and he, and he fasted as well. I don't know if some of you are aware in the Jewish world of a very famous rabbi called Shimon Bar Yochi and his son who were forced into a cave for 13 years and all they had was a Torah scroll and they had one set of clothes they drank water that dripped from a rock and they ate food uh, from a single carob tree. And that's how they survived for the 13 years. And they had interaction with nobody. And the, the stories about them speak of when they finally come out after 13 years of being in a cave and just learning Torah and not having any interaction with somebody. Uh, when uh, Shimon uh, Bayoki's son saw a Jew who was plowing in the field and not actually studying Torah, he, he couldn't comprehend it. And his, his uh, neshama was on a, such a high level that fire literally leapt from his eyes and incinerated this, this poor Jew who was farming and wasn't occupied in Torah. So whenever they saw that something was happening that wasn't directly uh, involved with the Torah... They, they had got to such a high level in those 13 years on their own studying and with no interaction that it was it was something that they couldn't cope with. And so, uh, in fact, at that time, they were I think they would uh, they'd only spent 10 years or 11 years and they had to go back and spend another further two or three years to kind of uh, get to a point where they could leave the cave and interact with people and not put anyone's lives at stake because they just weren't able to tolerate seeing any situation where, where somebody was doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, uh, was doing something yeah, that they shouldn't have been doing, uh, be it something not necessarily evil, but it's mundane. It's not directly related to the learning of the Torah. Uh, and so that's very interesting. So there's, that's a few examples. You have King David. He was also isolated. He was isolated. He was estranged from his brothers, rejected by his parents. Uh, because there was talk, there was some uh, rumor that, you know, some sort of legitimate illegitimacy to his birth. And it wasn't until Samuel came to anoint a potential uh, future king that uh, he saw all the, the brothers uh, uh, of David, the sons of Jesse. And he said, no, the, the oil, the anointing oil they have is, is dead in the water. It's not responding because the oil used to actually move and bubble if it came near somebody who had Ruach HaKodesh. And uh, he, he, Samuel approached uh, Yesi, uh, Yeshai, and he said, listen, do you have anyone else? And he goes, oh, the only other son I have is David, and he's out ruddy from the field. He's, he's filthy with the, pig, with the pigs, with the sheep. He's out with the sheep. He's, he's, he's tending the sheep, and he's dirty. And they went out, and as soon as Samuel got near David, the oil in, uh, in his uh, um, in vial, uh, or the shofar that he had, because they, they, they pour it into a shofar, and, the sh and they pour the anointing oil uh, onto the individual, began to bubble as though it was boiling uh, when it got when they got nearer and nearer to a young shepherd boy named 
David. So there's another example of, of a great being in solitude and being in isolation. So I, I ask you, if you're craving for fellowship, craving to have interaction with people, examine what is the motive that you have for this craving to interact with people. Is it to show people your great ideas and tell them about all your amazing opinions and your, your philosophies and your gleanings uh, about bizarre things? Uh, maybe you want to talk about the Nephilim. Maybe you want to talk about ancient technologies or something or, or, or just kind of have, have a group where you can have kind of a, a like a cool interaction with and, and have people say, well, that's amazing. You're amazing. Things like that. Is that what it is? Or is it perhaps you want to gain a following to possibly gain an income? Maybe you want to, you want cash flow. Uh, sure. I'm not doubting your, your faith in the Messiah and your love for the Torah, but is there some sort of ulterior motive here to possibly, um, you know, get some sort of donations coming your way. So sit down and analyze why have I got this strong desire to want to have fellowship when my desire to learn and my desire to uh, apply that learning and to do mitzvot isn't up on the same level. So rather than people saying, listen, I need to have fellowship, you need to learn and you need to learn to be obedient to that learning and to apply that learning in your life. That's what you need. All these other things will be added later. Now, those of you that want to rush off to a Messianic community, bear this in mind. The Messianic communities that we have today, they range from being very Christian-like uh, to, be to being very Jewish-like in the way that they operate. Uh, but having said that, I have met over my life less than five Messianic believers, less than five fingers that I have on this hand, who do not drive on the Shabbat. This is bearing in mind that the Messianic mindset across the board is that they are not Noahides. They are people that are eligible to keep the Torah like an Orthodox Jewish male. And yet in my last 25 years of interacting with the Messianic community, I have met less than five people who do not drive on the Shabbat. Okay, so there's an expectation there that you will be driving on the Shabbat because chances are, you will be living outside walking distance from a Messianic community wherever you may find it because there's so few and far between today. So that's one of the issues that uh, I would point out straight away of why you may be want to th rethink going to do that. Now, until the Messianic movement get front and center on their learning schedule, uh, learning the seven Noahide laws and learning that they're actually Noahides, this is going to continue to be the status quo. They're not going to teach you how to keep kosher. They are, they are going to talk about keeping kosher, perhaps, but they are not going to teach you how to keep kosher. And if you keep kosher, if you try to keep kosher in, in nowhere near a Jewish community, a community that actually sells kosher food, you will not be able to maintain uh, kosher observance, at least on the level that is expected you will then begin to dilute your observance and say, well, I keep the biblical kosher uh, as opposed to rabbinical kosher. And there's no such thing. There is only a rabbinical kosher. There is nothing else. The reason for that is because there are a lot of kosher laws that aren't actually mentioned in the written Torah. The Torah actually mentions what animals are kosher or not. And if the animal is not slaughtered in a kosher way, even if it is a kosher animal, it's not kosher. And that's just scratching the surface. Okay. Uh, uh, family purity and uh, uh, being with a, a wife who is at that time of the month. You will generally not learn anything about that, much less be uh, expected to actually adhere to that if you're married. And when we read the Torah, not the rabbinical writings, not the Midrash, but the actual written Torah, it says very specifically, if it's at that time of the month, you are not to share a bed with your wife, have any interaction with your wife. You are to take a break for eight to ten days. And the woman has to go someplace private and have an immersion before she is okay to be able to interact again with her husband. You will not find a messianic community, not only in Australia, but across the world, who will teach you how to do that. Despite the fact that Shaul, who the world calls the Apostle Paul, even says, I think it's in Corinthians, 
that a woman who is past that that period in her life where she no longer has the cycle, Shaul himself talks about the the husband and the wife agreeing on a certain time each month to have time apart. And one of the reasons it's so important to have a period of time apart at least once a month is it keeps a longevity to the relationship. It keeps the relationship exciting because it causes the couple to have a period where they take a break. And the idea is that during that break, the couple have a desire and a longing to get back with one another. And so what does that break look like? Well, you can't share a bed with the person. You, the person cannot hand anything to you and you cannot touch the person for a period of eight to 10 days. Now, this is bearing in mind, this is bearing in mind that the, that the Messianic community it con continues to reject the concept of being a Noahide, which is what they shouldn't be doing. They should accept the fact that they're Noahides. And therefore, if they do this, all these other things that I've just mentioned, like eating kosher, keeping family purity laws, are not applicable to them. Do you understand that? I hope you do. It can, it can be a bit complicated, a bit hard to follow this. But the, 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 the biggest problem in the Messianic movement is they're not acknowledging that there are Noahides and a Noahide is, uh, is not mandated and not held to the same standard of accountability as an Orthodox Jewish male. An Orthodox Jewish female doesn't even the same level of observance as an Orthodox Jewish male. So there's various levels of observance depending on what your station is. And if you did not have a Jewish mother, you weren't brought up in a from Jewish house, an observant Jewish house then trying to obey all the 613 laws that are applicable to you, you know, in like uh, if you're living at Blackheath or somewhere in the in the Blue Mountains or somewhere, you know, somewhere away from everywhere, it's almost impossible unless you've got the the, the mentality of Bear Grylls, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, what else do I want to talk about this? Um Messianic communities, they're really not going to teach you anything much more than talking about the Messiah. In my years of experience, they're not going to teach you really that much about the laws of Shemarat Halashon, that is clean speech, which you should be learning on a constant basis, and nor will they encourage you to be learning on a constant basis. How's your learning of Shemarat Halashon going? Um, are, you, are you still constantly learning? We talk a lot, so it stands to reason that we need to learn a lot about how to talk. Uh, they don't tell you or give you much teaching on how to maintain modesty uh, that is to you know dress in appropriate manner and also to avoid places of immodesty you won't get any types of teachings like that you'll the messianic communities are all but bereft of any teachings of Musa which is the improvement of ethics and the refinement of one's characters and the, the uh, rectification improvement of a person's character uh, you'll really get no uh, teaching on how to do tshuva like in a practical sense um, now, I'm speaking generally, so I'm sure some groups might do something like that. But every group, rather, is based on focusing its uh, Torah portion readings on doing where's Wally with the Messiah and simply pointing out the Messiah in the Tanakh. That's the majority of things that they do. And they don't really teach you any sort of thing that you can actually learn and, and just bring into, into practice. Uh, so you may want to have a think about that. They are not going to teach you how to do mitzvot. Uh, it'll be general if they teach it at all. It'll be mainly focused on where is the Messiah and the Messiah's done this and he's doing this and he's going to do this. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're fleeing to the mountains and, you know, you can, you can buy this pallet of food and it'll last you a year and all this, all this, all this sheker, all this nonsense. Uh, fleeing to the mountains isn't going to be the thing that saves you. It's going to be be the best person you can possibly be and face all of your flaws and all of the things you're struggling at and you will be able to stand before the Messiah because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to be able to present ourselves in as best possible spiritual state as we can when it comes our time to meet the Messiah, whether it's on that great terrible day when he arrives or whether it's an individual encounter that we have when we are called and uh, it's that time that we, we have to leave the world as individuals. Uh, I hope this video is helpful. Uh, I hope it's um, not too annoying and not too upsetting for you. Um, but yeah, forget about 
having this desire to have fellowship, being at the forefront. I'm not saying forget about fellowship like it's something you shouldn't do. Yes, you, you should have fellowship. But what is what does fellowship look like? The main thrust is that you want to learn and you want to set a schedule and you want to try and apply that learning. But if you're sitting at home and kind of drifting around the house and flicking on and off a TV, uh, looking at your phone, you are a million miles away. You know, and, and in rocking up, you know, on a Saturday uh, at a Messianic uh, gathering, you are a million miles away from where you need to be. The ironic thing is, it's not until I withdrew myself from attending uh, social Messianic uh, uh, situations that I began to improve spiritually. That's the fact. That's a reality. And that should be a, a huge revelation to all you people that are still interacting in these social settings you know it's 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 just it's stunting the growth uh largely where most of us we really aren't spiritually mature enough to spend much time together in a social setting now so what social settings constitute coming together okay i, I will um i will enumerate them uh they are teaching they are learning they are prayer they are eating and they are helping others these are the five situations that enable a believer to have interaction and social interaction with a person. If these five other things aren't at the core of why you're getting together, then it's just a social like anything else. Uh, now, so the verse that often gets trotted out is from Acts 2 uh, verse 42 that says, They devoted themselves to the teaching. Uh, uh, th this is talking about the apostles. They devoted themselves to the teachings and to gathering together or having fellowship together and the breaking of bread and to fill out to prayer. Okay, so the word used there in most translations in Acts 2, uh, 42 is the word fellowship. But you could just as easily insert the word communicating and in the context it's speaking about learning. They were learning together or teaching together. And they were eating together. You got to eat, and it's it's important that you eat with fellow believers because we're not animals. We're not like a lion that grabs a portion of the of the animal that we just killed and drags it off and eats it. You know, in solitude, we're human beings. That's what differentiates us. One of the things that differentiates from the animal species. Uh, and if we are uh, praying, and obviously if we're helping somebody, and maybe somebody needs a few of us to turn up that can actually uh, facilitate uh, a gathering of believers. So, you know, it's not about necessarily physically being together because we are together all the time in the spirit. And there is definitely merit if uh, two or more are gathered. Uh, but that's not to say if somebody's on their own, nothing's happening. Something's always happening. But there is, and, and obviously there's a minyan uh, in, the, in the Orthodox Jewish world. Uh, talking about getting 10 men together that makes it eligible for you to be able to take out the Torah scroll. But again, this gathering is there for a fixed time of prayer. It's not a time of spontaneous prayer. It's a time of fixed prayer that certain beats are hit in the prayers that were laid down by the men of the Great Assembly, made up largely of uh, uh, very wise rabbis and some prophets who are still alive at the time. Uh, and and so there's no real spontaneous prayer going on. They're just hitting a formula and having kavana with that formula. And the community, the the more of them they are, the better. The stronger that they are, the better. So you get you can have more people, but they might not be very spiritually very strong. You might have few people, at least ten, and they're spiritually really solid. Uh, that's that's great. That's that, that blows away thousands of believers who aren't sort of strong at all, have, have no sort of foundation at all. Um, there is the concept, also I mentioned before I go, of hit but a dut, that is isolation. Yeshua himself was constantly, continuously withdrawing from the crowds. Now he would see the crowds and he had mercy on them and he, he was emotional when he saw the crowds and he, you know, he said they were like a sheep without a shepherd. But whatever opportunity, whatever chance he would get, he would withdraw himself from very crowded social situations and he would seek times of solitude and be on his own now i'm talking about yeshua here and so you want to be don't you want to have the same like-mindedness as the messiah isn't that what i always hear people say well if that's the case 
you're not really fussed about trying to, you know, get a concert together, organizing a huge event with hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, it's just a, a blur. You know, there's just so many voices that, that are trying to be, scream out to be heard. You want to take yourself to a quiet place, isolated, as the Messiah would often do. The Messiah, even when he prays spontaneously from the heart, he does that prayer privately. Now, why is spontaneous prayer private? Because if you are praying with other people and it's not the fixed prayer that I'm talking about that happens on the Sabbath or high holy days, you will always posture what you say because other people are listening. Whether you posture by refraining from things that would be incriminating or embarrass you, or you say things to actually make yourself grander or more impressive to people. So when you're praying, you're actually not praying at all. You're actually just praying a prayer so everybody hears how awesome your prayer is. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, I think I mentioned everything. I've got some notes sort of stuck around here and I'm making sure that it hit everything. Yeah, if you if you, you really rush off to, to meet up with a group, you're going to expose yourself to all sorts of different people and different people. You'll, you'll be exposing yourself to people who aren't religious at all. They've been dragged along by people there against their better judgment, if you can call it better judgment. And they're just, you know, and, and they've got no, no clue. And, and then, you know, you'll get other people that are, are kind of on their high horse. And there's a lot of things there. Um, you know, you just, you, you want to be away from, from the potential for Lush and Hara uh, way more than anything that you think you can get out of a group setting. Um, some verses uh, where Yeshua withdrew to private places. Matthew 14, verses 22 to 23. Mark uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. And John 6, 15, to name a few. <sighs> Being isolated. Stop complaining about it. Stop whinging about it. Do what you can do now. That you're in that. Imagine if you're in a prison cell. And, and you can get access to, to Torah. As much Torah as you want. <laughs> You'd be like, okay, that bring it on. It's like, do I get my walk every two hours in the courtyard? Yep. Okay, I'm happy. I can learn. I can learn. Being found in a state of learning is the great, is the best place to be found. Um, okay, so just to underscore what I said, I'm not saying that fellowship is something that you should not want, but I should ask. I'm asking you in this video to relook at what you think fellowship is and what the biblical definition of it is. That is something grounded in learning. Uh, being taught, uh, prayer, uh, and eating, and helping other people, uh, doing good deeds. It's not just an excuse if you get together and, you know, you have these groups and they'll, they'll go to like um, go-karting or something like that. And there's nothing intrinsically evil about that. But, you know, that's an hour you, you go-karting that you could have been sitting down and learning something. And I'm telling you, the biggest stumbling block that's going to hit a lot of people in their judgment is when they start pleading the ignorance card and that's when their trouble starts because then the, the court goes, okay, all right, you spent this many hours watching this. You spent this many hours interacting in this. This was neither here nor there. It wasn't evil, but you chose to do this for X amount of years. Like we've tallied it all up the time. And so you could have used some of these hours or these years to learn some of this stuff, which would eventually led you to learn to actually find out about that thing that you weren't doing. But you chose not to. You didn't think it was that bad. You didn't think it was that important. Listen, people are going to accuse you of being too extreme. Just avoid those people. You can never be too extreme. You can never be too extreme. As soon as you start getting wishy-washy and you go, ah, oh, it's okay. That whole thing, when you put the hand goes up, you go, ah, it's all right, she'll be right. Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand's saying is she'll be right. Australia's saying is she'll be right, mate. They're some of the worst expressions known to man. If you have that attitude, oh, she'll be right, mate. Basically means like, oh, it's okay, it's not the best. It's probably not going to work out exactly how I want it, but it'll do. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really kind of a lazy man's sort of comment. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. If you got this far through the video, wow, you're amazing. Um, please stay stay tuned. Uh, keep pl praying for Israel. 
Uh, I think the the Jordanians have basically said that they're going to allow Israel to use their airspace in case they have to do some gnarly stuff over the Jordanian airspace. So that's amazing. Uh, this doesn't surprise me because Israel, from what I understand, supplied Jordan with drinking water. Uh, so they probably want to make sure that they, because they've got pretty much a symbiotic relationship with the nation of Israel. And I think uh, Iran and, and a lot of the Arab world have kind of got shocked at uh, which way Jordan has decided to swing. Uh, and I have fond memories of the Jordanian king um, taking to the to the skies to fight ISIS after uh, ISIS uh, dealt with one of their, their captured uh, Jordanian pilots so horrifically and televised his burning. Uh, it was so good to see the king of Jordan uh, take to the air and, uh, and uh, put pay to those ISIS terrorists. Uh, so keep praying, uh, keep learning. Uh, keep being connected with uh, with whoever you're learning under and uh, and ask questions and, and do whatever you can to propel yourself in a, in a state where you can uh, have some sort of you can increase your interaction but all I'm saying is don't run uh, to to groups to have fellowship like that's going to be the be all end or antidote to all your depression depressive feelings that you have at the moment you need to feel good on your own if you're ever going to feel good with other people. Thank you so much for joining.